Hello and welcome to episode 20 of This Week in Horror. Welcome back. 20 weeks, hard to believe. I'm Matt Robb, as always, joined by my very lovely co-host and my favorite body part not attached to my actual body. Miss <laughs> oh, wow. Stacey Lane Wilson is what with a us. We are back, and you notice I've got some fashionable wristwear this week. That's quite beautiful. You know, it is. I had one of those too, but it you somehow did. we didn't go to a matching rehab clinic. We actually <laughs> went to Weekend of Horrors this past weekend down at uh, in, near LAX, I guess, which yeah, is the airport. The beautiful, the beautiful downtown Marriott. Los Angeles. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, big thanks to, uh, to everybody we saw down there. Creation Entertainment's Weekend of Horrors was a blast. We uh, we had it a was. booth there. We did some interviews. We saw some of our good friends. Uh, yeah, Aja Argento was down there. John I Carpenter. I think it's Ajia. Asia. Asia. I am not going to remember yes. that. Okay. So I'm just going to go with Asia. <laughs> All right. Asia How about Argento Brooke Lewis? I know Brooke you Lewis. can pronounce that. I can pronounce Brooke Lewis's name. She was there. John Carpenter. <laughs> yep. Lance Hendrickson from last week was That's there. That's right. He Lance was books. there selling lots of books. Lots of books. He got lots, a lot of books. Yeah. I know. Great. Actually, we had his books at our table, mm -hmm. and people kept coming over saying, "Where's Lance?" I know. I know. Like it was a big draw, which was great for us. But. So yeah. So big thank you to to Creation Entertainment <laughs> yeah. for for letting us crash their party. It was a lot of fun. We're going a little dark this week. We're going we a little are? darker this week. Uh -oh. We are talking to a man who has kind of brought the embodiment of evil to film and some of the most iconic kind of evil characters with films like Near Dark and Body Parts and The Hitcher. And last week, actually, Lance Henriksen had mentioned that Near Dark was one of the best scripts he had ever read. He did. And, and with praise like that, I want to mm -hmm. welcome Eric Red to the studio. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> Hi, in today, Eric. Eric. Hi, how are you? Excellent. Very nice to be here. Very nice to have you with us. So let's kick it off right away. I want to talk about Near Dark. Now, with that praise from Lance, I mean, he was a big fan of the film and he was a big fan of the script. How much, uh, once you once you wrote it with Catherine Bigelow, how much intel did you have in the process? Were you on set at all? No. Um, I was directing Cohen and Tate oh, okay. at that point. So, um, But the script, the, the film stayed very close to the script. Interesting. How did that collaboration start between you and Catherine and the director and Lance and everyone? On that particular project? On that particular project, yeah. Well, Catherine and I wrote several scripts together, um, and this was the second. And uh, we, we basically were trying to think of what to write next, and as I recall, um, I said, let's do a vampire film. She said, let's do a Western, and then we sort of said, well, let's <laughs> well, do it's both. It's like your peanut butter's in my chocolate. <laughs> and, um, just, we just referencing old TV commercials mm, yeah. for no particular Why reason. Not? <laughs> So the concept, so basically, so you kind of met in the middle between vampire and western, and that was where the idea of a of a western vampire film came from. Well, you know, once we sort of tried to explore what vampires would be like if they really existed, and uh, we wanted to stay away from things like fangs and all of the cliches, you know. And in in sort of thinking about vampires, you know, it would it seemed that they would have certain vulnerabilities. And they would have to live, if the modern day, you know, they would have to live on the run. They'd be very vulnerable to law enforcement, to sunlight. You know, and in, in making it a Western and setting it out in the Midwest, you had the wonderful thing with the sun coming up, you know, constantly in the flatlands. But kind of the more the story and the characters developed, it kind of took on a, they sort of, the logic led to sort of a, a, an American outlaw. You know, like Jesse James or Bonnie and Clyde, you know, this sort of itinerant existence of, you know, going from hotel to hotel and, you know, and uh, that was sort of kind of where we started with it. Well, had there been any film like this previously that you guys could sort of um, reference at all? Because it seems to me like it would be the first vampire western that I can think of, but it spawned sort of a whole, it did. A whole it, genre it, of it them. Did. <laughs> well, you know, back in those days, unlike these days, uh -huh. you know, when we started a movie, we did, the idea was to do something original. Oh, yeah. And back the in idea those of days. doing a vampire western seemed like a very original thing, and the fact that it hadn't been done before, um, you know, kind of fired your jets. Mm. Uh, this was long before the remake, you know, it was good once, let's do it again kind of thing. Um, and and I think the Near Dark, I've seen it, it's been constantly referenced and, and the sort of southwestern vampire genre. I Absolutely. Guess, now, does that it. make you feel good or does it make you feel like, well, geez, I wish somebody else would come up with something new? Mixture both. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, it's really nice, you know, when you know you see that these films get remaged, which is sort of my word for ripoff. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've, you know, kind of, I've, you know, I've done it too. You know, there's movies you 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 love that are influential, and you kind of channel them sometimes. But it's nice to see your own films channeled. 
<laughs> now I want to talk about casting. Adrian Pastar, who's who's now more famous for for the hero's role that he was in, was your lead as kind of the protagonist of the film. But I noticed when I first saw the film, and as as did other people when talking to them, we all kind of related more towards the vampires. Was that kind of was that an, an initial goal, or did you was that an unintentional thing? Well, I have certain reservations in the casting in the movie. Um, uh, Johnny Depp screen tested for the part that uh, Pastar played oh, wow. and D.B. Sweeney did. And I wasn't crazy about Adrian Pastar in the film. And I think he's a wonderful actor and I think he's done wonderful things there. I didn't think then or now that he had the charisma to make the audience root for him as you know as a kid so what happened is the movie became kind of vampire heavy oh, <laughs> you know the vampires became bad guys will always kind of take over the movie mm -hmm. unless you're really careful because mm -hmm. they get to do all the kind of bad things that the good guys generally can't do it's true and i thought this film was a bit of a case of that interesting so that kind of changed as production went on like you realized that in casting you're like okay it's going to have to be more about bill paxton and lance rather than adrian is that kind of no nope, the 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 film is is extremely faithful to the script. Oh, that's great. Excellent. Wow. But I think the, the also, you know, when you have an 18 or 17 or 18 year old lead, you know, and I think, uh, you know, the, the vampires with their history, with their clannishness, with their kind of protectiveness, their, their whole dynamic is just more interesting. And, you know, that's, they, they wind up kind of carry, taking the film and that's, that's fine. Now you mentioned that you screen tested for for Adrian's character. Did you have Bill Paxton in mind when you first thought about this character, the character of Severn, or was was that someone? Who... Had nobody in mind for any of the characters. Really? I almost never do. Hmm. Um, I I, I kind of like to keep characters pure in the writing, and sometimes after I finished it, um, I'll have a, a a clear idea of who I th I think would be good to play in it. But I don't think it's a good idea usually unless you know that actor is part of the project from the beginning. To cat to use a uh, to base it on an actor, you want the to develop the character in its own voice. So no, there was none of the actors were and that were in the film or in any of the other films I've done were planned. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, I, 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 talking about vampires in film as a, as a rule, I mean, as we said, a lot of modern vampire tales kind of go with that southwestern vampire feel. True Blood being one of the most popular. Uh -huh. What are your thoughts on kind of how the genre has morphed into this? Well, there's two sects. There's the the raunchy vampires, and then there's mm -hmm. the soft, sparkly vampires. <laughs> what are your thoughts on how it's kind of morphed? I mean, your your tale was probably one of the most pure vampire stories, without kind of branching off into that romance at all. What are your thoughts on where it is now? I don't know where the hell it is right now. It's, <laughs> it's throw everything against the wall and see what sticks uh -huh. with vampires. I mean, they, except for kind of an edgy sexuality, I don't see that there's any overriding, you know, in the fact that they're immortal. I, I think it's been, the whole vampire genre has been kind of dumbed down to the point where it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, would you be interested in taking on another vampire project and maybe reinvigorating the scene? Um, well, I actually have one script called Nightlife, which is a contemporary vampire story that yeah, that's about a, a a man and two sisters who become vampires. That deals that deals with the kind of the the edgier, more predatory aspects of the of the vampire world, which seem to have a logic. I mean, I think you always have to, whether you're dealing with vampires, werewolves, monsters, kill any one of these sort of bad guys, try to find or make an effort to find what the human kind of psychology is underneath these kind of mythologies. Hmm. Well, um, your first feature as a writer was The Hitcher? Yes. Is that correct? Now, how, where did you come up with that idea? How did it first come to you? It first came to me from the Doors song Riders in the Storm, ah. which I thought, you know, it was, those guys were all, you know, film students. Mm -hmm. And it was such a cinematic song. Absolutely. And that image of, you know, the guy picking up, the guy, the guy standing on the road in the rain, and all the audio they did, the wonderful you know, sound effects and everything along with the music, that it just always suggested a great opening for a film. And I thought that it would be a tremendous first 10 minutes for a picture. You know, and, and then what? <laughs> where did you go from there, right? Well, what, I, I left New York at the time, uh, and I was driving to Texas where I lived. And I had that whole kind of trip on the road to sort of figure out. And I just, in writing that script, I said, what's the last thing I think I would think would happen next and I tried to keep it to play with expectations. Mm. So if you actually encountered a hitcher on your trip 
film might not have gotten made because it would have been a little too close to comfort. But you know, the truth of the matter is the hitchhikers aren't the dangerous ones. The people who pick them up are. Mm. Ah, an interesting twist there it is. Well, let's actually take a look uh, at a clip from the film from The Hitcher. We've got it, so let's, uh, let's take a look at that. Okay. What do you want? <laughs> What's so funny? That's where the other guy said. <laughs> Who's the other guy? The guy who was driving that car back there. The guy who picked me up before you did. Was that him in the car? Yeah, sure it was. Because it walked very far. Why is that? Because I cut off his legs. And his arms. And his head. And I'm gonna do the same to you. Probably not the best thing to say on a first date. No. Come on, let me say no, that. I don't no, think not. so. You'll have to take that one out of your repertoire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've learned from that film not to well, do that. Well, you know, as a writer, you know, you, you write those lines. Mm -hmm. And it was written in a kind of very spare, blank kind of verse, that opening scene. And the thrill when it's played that well. I mean, what, the, what uh, you know, Rutger and, and Tommy brought to that scene. And, the, you know, the... the it, the humor, the menace, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, Record just had that, that quality at the time of abs in, in being enjoyably malevolent. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Absolutely. And it's, I know. it's awesome. I mean, it's, it, it, I get a kick out of that every time I see it. You know, I'm curious to know, when you first wrote this character of John Ryder, now obviously you didn't have any actors in mind, as you said, you, you know, just wrote the story. I'm curious to know what Rutger brought to the role himself and how he added dimension to it and sort of how it's it's aged over time. Do you look at the film the same way and his performance as you did then? Pretty much. We screened it uh, recently uh, at Screamfest, uh, screened it downtown. I hadn't seen the picture for uh, probably about 10 years. Um, and I thought it absolutely held up. You know, it was, uh, what I love about it was, was how tight and how well shot and, uh, you know, all the things I tried to do in the script with creating a sense of claustrophobia and yet in these wide open spaces, you know, just came across so well. And I think that Rutger had, Rutger had a kind of supernatural physicality. I think Jack Kroll, Newsweek, referred to him as having the depraved glamour of a fallen angel. <laughs> and that, Beautiful. That nailed it. That Absolutely. was just that, he had that, you know, uh, bigger than life, just that there was just that he was part not real. Hmm. Um, now, what was it like to see your script translated to the screen from someone else? Um, the, uh, Robert Harmon directed it? Yes. So did he make any changes that you were unhappy with or the ones that you thought were perhaps better for the story? Anything? Um, no. Um, you know, we, we had developed the script, uh, the producers and I, um, before Robert came aboard pretty, pretty carefully. And we had it down to, I think, a, a pretty much what we, we finally shot. Um, and how did he like working like that? Did he feel like he was constricted at all, do you know? Uh, Robert read the script and thought it was a well-oiled machine. Good. <laughs> well, he'd done, the, the, we were looking for a director, and we did the film actually independently within the studio system. It was financed, it was financed by equity, and you know, we had a distribution deal through TriStar. But we were looking for a director, and Robert had done this short film uh, called China Lake, which was about, uh, he, he was a first-time director, he never directed a feature, but he'd done this 35 millimeter scope film about a, a rogue cop in the desert that was so much the hitcher. I mean, it had really? so much the feel, the visuals, the performance beats. I mean, it was, it was just a marriage made in heaven. Hmm. Now you mentioned uh, casting. 
invulnerability. Uh, the vulnerability of both C. Thomas Howell and Jennifer Jason Lee is just, it's epic in this film. I mean, the, my favorite scene is by far is the, the truck stretching sequence. Uh, uh, now, yeah, it would be your favorite. Oh, come scene. on. It's great. It's so, it's so intense and it's so cringeworthy. I mean, <laughs> it is. playing to an audience at that time, I mean, how, what was the reaction like when you first played that scene? I mean, w you know, watching audiences' reaction or critical reaction. I saw the film play in Times Square uh, one night and there was a guy in the audience, uh, you know, an African-American gentleman. And as the scene was coming to its conclusion, he says, they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. Then, oh, my God, they're going to do it. Oh, my God, they're going to do it. You know, so it's nobody expects it to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that was why the, the scene was there. You never expect uh, a girl you, you like in the movie, you know, the heroine to get killed, let alone in that kind of ultimate horrific situation. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Now, I mean, our, the audiences today, by far, are, are very jaded. And, and looking at something like this, where you have the remake, which almost copied the film scene for scene, was it, what, were the, what were the complications, the difficulties kind of remaking this film? Was it that jaded audience? Do you feel like you had to up the ante? I mean, where were, where were the problems there? Well, you know, that one scene is a real kind of interesting example, I think, of why the technique we used in the first film is was so superior to what they tried to do in the second one. You know, we never showed, and you wouldn't show, the uh, Jennifer Jason Lee getting ripped in half. You mm -hmm. know, we never did makeup effects. We, you know, it's it's not really how you show it; it's how you don't show it. And by keeping it off the screen and just showing, as we did, the the, the truck wheels turning mm -hmm. and the sound of the engine and her scream, the audience interfaces. They they project. You know, they you know they have their own pictures. Yeah, you leave it to the imagination. And, you know, when you leave it to the imagination, it's much more involving. And, you know, w there were real screams of dismay in the original. That's I, great. <laughs> I understand in the remake when they actually filmed a version of the a character getting torn apart, people cheered or applauded. And you see, when you show something like that, it's, it takes the audience out of the movie. You know, I'm, I'm kind of much more of the school where you kind of find ways not to show something and then let the audience, it's much scarier. Well, I, I was on set in Texas when they shot the remake and it was at that particular scene, the truck ripping scene that I, I witnessed when they were filming it. And I actually got to interview Sean Bean who was really quite reverent about taking on the role that Rutger Hauer had played previously. And he is a terrific actor, but I'm curious to know what you think about sort of what each actor brought to that role that's different and why perhaps Sean's didn't resonate as much as Rutger's always will. Well, I mean, I thought the remake was terrible and it's not a secret. Um, you know, they they threw away all of the psychology mm -hmm. in the picture between the kid and the hitcher, you know, and they turned one character, uh, C. Thomas Howell character, into two, yes. which diminished the suspense, and they removed from the John Ryder character any psychology, you know, what any kind of motivation. And Sean Bean's a terrific actor, mm -hmm. and he has great presence, and he had great, really good presence in the movie, but besides the fact Rutgers a terribly hard act to follow in terms of menace. Yes. You know, he really is. He's like one of the most menacing bad guys ever in movies. I think that uh, poor Sean Bean just didn't have a character to work with much, except so he was sort of stuck with playing, a, you know, your kind of garden variety serial killer on the mm -hmm. road. But I, I didn't think they, I, I thought the remake managed to miss all the things that made the first movie work. Hmm. Now, switching gears just a little bit, we're still in the human genre. Um, you hit two milestones. Well, actually, you hit one milestone recently in the 20th anniversary of Body Parts at Cinefamily with our friends at the Silent Movie Theater. Yes. How did that go, actually, the screening? Oh, it was so much fun. Yeah, it, yeah, it was It was great. We had a packed house. Uh, you know, I, did, I didn't know if anybody was going to show up for it. You know, um, <laughs> And the great thing about it was 90% of the audience had never seen the film before. Uh. And they were seeing the film the way it was supposed to be seen. That's you know, great. And... and, and widescreen anamorphic with, you know, the, the sound dub on the big screen. And it played really, really well. They had a really good time. They screamed at all the right places. R responded differently to certain scenes than people did a few years ago. Hmm. But I think they had a really good time, and it was very, very gratifying to show the film for, uh, you know, for an audience that hadn't seen it before. 
That's excellent. And it's, it's very timely, too, because only a few short weeks ago, UCLA, actually, they, they succeeded in their first ever hand transplant. I don't know if you heard about this, but it actually happened, <laughs> which is ironic because that's basically what the film is about. I mean, we have a little footage here oh, with yeah. basically what they did, and it almost looks like a few scenes from the film. It's kind of interesting. Oh, they actually, they, they actually <laughs> hand transplanted. the film looks a little it's better. It's a little than better. Than it's a less, l- less CGI back in 91. <laughs> but, I mean, it's kind of interesting how this is now, it's no longer science fiction. It's science fact. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is that kind of mind blowing? When you were first, writing, you know, working on this script and working on the film, did you ever think that this would this would one day be like, oh yeah, no, just get a get an arm from a serial killer? <laughs> well, it was a speculative science movie. Mm-hmm. To, to it's you know, it's a horror movie and it's a fun picture, but there's a speculative science element to it. So we were trying to imagine what the psychology and the the medical procedure would be. There was we. Um, you know, we attended tri- uh, grafting operations at uh, St. John's Hospital in Toronto mm-hmm. for this film. So we would, you know, we had a technical advisors on the picture, and you know, the big microscopes that you see in the um, that's right, in that the sequence, hand right there. Yeah, I mean, it's, look the, at that. those were all from the, are used were used in in grafting operations. Oh wow, huh? Interesting. So it was very true to life. Yeah. Just Are you sure this was the first hand transplant? I, it was the first successful hand transplant that happened recently. It was it was complete. Yeah, that's what oh. I'm told. Okay. Our researchers <laughs> in our offices are telling me this, so I believe. Yeah, that's what I'm told. You know, I'd heard a funny story about five years ago. I'd heard that they'd done one in France, mm-hmm. and that six months later the guy had gone back uh, and said he wanted it removed. Oh, so he maybe wanted that's hand what removed. he meant. Because he was strangling his wife. But actually, <laughs> I think you've had a hand transplant. That's what this is all about. That is, right? yeah, it's the wrist. It's the wrist. <laughs> it's the wrist band. Yeah, it's the wristband. I'm actually just got out of the hospital this morning, and it's working fine. I don't understand see, what's wrong with it. See how committed he is I to am. our show? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I do it. It's all for you, Eric. <laughs> now, I'm curious to know actually, this uh, movie was based on a novel, correct? Yes. Um, what is the name of the novel, and what inspired you to uh, adapt it? The book was a book called Choice Cuts by um, Pierre Bolio and Thomas Narkajak, who were two very well-known uh, French authors who wrote the books that the films Diabolique and Vertigo were based on. Oh, okay. And they were kind of, uh, I guess they were the Stephen King of their era. And I'd heard about the book from its uh, logline, um, just the, which was the, basically the concept of the film, the, the idea that a killer's executed killer's body parts are grafted onto five, a bunch of different people who then start dying under mysterious circumstances. And I thought that was just a great, I immediately th- thought it was a, a terrific idea that you could do a psychological thriller, but also have one that had a lot of gore and a lot <laughs> yes. of, you know, the whole, it would be a mixture of the two. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got a hold of the book and I read it. Um, and ultimately I, I made a few significant changes to it. But the, as it turned out, the book had a 20-year development history at studios. Oh, did you know that when you s- I did took not. it on? <laughs> yeah, no. otherwise you may not have, right? <laughs> well, um, you know, we had to get the rights to the we had to get the rights from the other studio. But the 20 writers, including Robert Benton, oh, had wrote goodness. versions of this, um, more or less sticking to the book with the certain problems that the book had inherent ah. in it. Hmm. So you thought outside the box and changed it up a little bit. What did you change? Well, in the book, it's the main character is a detective who's investigating these this executed killer and his the people dying, and I felt that it needed a a, a main character who was one of the transplant recipients, uh, so, so he would be the invested. point of view. Uh-huh. Huh. Um, so that was one change, and the other change was at the end. Again, the killer's head's been put on another body, but the doctor's going back and getting the body parts. Oh. And I thought we should have Charlie mm-hmm. go out and get his <laughs> parts back and, you know, have that whole, you know, slasher thing. That great sequence, yeah. I mean, I, I, one of the things that I love about the film is the is the tagline, which is up on the poster here, where does evil live, the heart, the mind, or the flesh, which is just fantastic. It kind of just tells the story for you. We actually have a clip, for those of you who haven't seen the film yet, which is available everywhere. Let's take a look at the clip right now. Just pieces of this guy we got, not his, uh, not him, you know? That's what I'm wondering, see. I mean, where is evil, um, where does it live? Does it live in the, uh, soul? In the mind? Maybe it lives in the heart? Maybe it lives in the flesh? How can one man kill so many people? Bill. 
You gotta stop torturing yourself. Lay off the metaphysical speculation. It's a waste of fucking time, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Maybe evil lives in the skin. I don't know. The camaraderie of these three guys, these, and they're all so naturalistic in that scene, and they all have this, they're part of a club, this really disturbing a club. A very exclusive having, club yeah. that you really don't want to be a member of. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, do you feel like the film is saying that evil lives in our physical being? I mean, are you trying to say something with that, or is it in our DNA, or where does it come from? The film kind of poses questions and it doesn't take itself all that seriously this the film um, body parts is not a deep rooted <laughs> yeah. the it's name not a alone serious might give you a little cl clue yeah. there right <laughs> i mean we we played with it but i, I mean it, it it could either be that i mean for a lot of the movie um all of these characters could be having these personality changes because of you know the trauma of losing a limb and you know what's happened to them psychologically or the body part could be taking them over and it was fun just sort of presenting that but it's not a film that makes uh, you know that makes it is that deep about its you know psychological underpinnings it's supposed to be a fun horror epic and it is but you Good. do have some uh, really iconic characters that do have those dark underpinnings, and I'm wondering what it is that keeps drawing you back to that. What is it that you haven't yet feel like you've discovered that you must explore through these characters that you write? Well, I mean, Jeff Faye's character is actually a family man, and you know he's uh, you know he's somebody who suffers a you know a tremendous trauma. And he he ultimately has to work his way through the trauma and you know, basically take over this arm, you know, get it back. He actually breaks the killer's neck with his own arm in the film, in order to you know come back to his family. Right. And you know, I mean, he what made him sympathetic was, you know, nothing in his background has led him to the set of incidents which are going to make him leave his family, which at one point he does before he's reunited with them. You know, I mean, I don't know that. I would use the word dark as much as as, as you know you suggest. I mean, the, the painter's a hack, you know, and he loses his arm and he has this terrible thing. And perhaps it's just that which is you know brought him closer to his talent. Mm -hmm. But I mean, throughout the body of your career or the body parts of your career, but you know, you've got the Hitcher and you've got um, other characters like in A Hundred Feet that are pretty dark. Um, why do you still keep wanting to explore this realm? Well. The approach I take is to try to treat these characters and these situations as if it were real and to find out, you know, try to explore, you know, what is the reality of the psychology of these characters? What's the, you know, I mean, when you have a hitchhiking killer and he, you know, and he, you know, frames this kid in the hitcher for, for his killings and then pursues him and manipulates the situation, you have to come up with a logic. And, you know, the logic leads you to a, uh, you know, to, to a psychology. So are you as fascinated by true crime as you are in exploring these kind of things in a fictional way? No, not especially. Most killers are kind of, you know, fairly unimaginative, you know. But I think, you know, you, you, you try to, I try to deal with all of these people, you know, uh, in, in a realistic way. And that's where, I guess, you know, some people say that, the darkness comes from because mm -hmm. you know otherwise you're just doing a movie about a guy with a in a hockey mask with a machete it's true and that's a whole other thing of things um, now the one thing that I got out of this it's there's a there's a few parallels to kind of a Frankensteinian story I mean there's in the film itself it almost feels like a different perspective telling the Frankenstein story mm -hmm. and I think one of those things that definitely alludes to that is the amazing score I mean, we, we talked earlier, and one mm -hmm. of the things that I absolutely adore about this film is the score, the symphonic, just just for both score. What were, uh, how did how did you get there with the with the Luke Luke Dicker, correct? Yeah, I mean, I told Paramount making the film. I mean, from the beginning, I wanted to do what they call an acoustic or a symphonic score. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wanted to go Bernard Herrmann. You know, it was an epic horror movie, really. I mean, it was supposed to have that kind of scale. And w part of the way that was going to get us there was a big, thundering, terrifying, and melodic you know, um, score. And 
was we tried to find you know we looked at different composers and I saw the Fourth Man the Verhoeven movie mm -hmm. which I admired a lot and I really admired the music and I think the cameraman Theo van de Zand who's Dutch suggested uh, Luke Dicker so we flew Luke to um, to L.A. and mm -hmm. I gave him the job. Excellent, and then it definitely helped the film. I mean, like I said, we spoke earlier, uh, and the, f the one thing I remember before I rewatched the film was the score. That was the one thing that just stayed with me for years and years and years, and it's epic. In both the title sequence and the credits at the end where they're sitting in the park, it's just one of those things that stays with you, and it's truly, it's iconic in the truest sense of the word. Um, Luke's incredibly talented. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, I mentioned at the beginning, he had to compose, because we didn't have our credits finished at the time, he had to compose that whole opening credit scene. Um, with basically just a, a strip of film with grease paint marks Duh. where the credits came in, and you know he, it, it's it's was it was art. Yeah, I mean it's, I think it's actually one of the best horror horror film scores ever. Yeah, truly. Yeah, it's definitely up there. Absolutely. Now I want to talk about the direction of the film because as you are a writer, this was one of the films that you also directed. Working with someone like Fahey, he definitely borders on that line between kind of the father and being crazy. I mean, mm -hmm. he, there, there are some scenes where he literally jumps back and forth a few times within the same scene. Was it difficult getting that out of Jeff? No, although uh, <laughs> if the reason being Jeff in person has, I think, 12 brothers. Oh, wow. And he comes from a very big um, Irish, uh, Irish family. And so the, that familial, those family elements, that mm -hmm. he has tremendous in person, tremendous personal warmth. And he's a great guy. And, you know, I wanted to bring that out a lot. So that was, that was sort of the, the side I, I, I worked during the movie to, to bring out, but it's definitely there. The, the more intense stuff with his eyes, mm -hmm. with everything else was easier, but he had that family man, the, all of those aspects that, again, that warmth you know, built in. And also, uh, looking at the cast, you're one of the rare directors who's able to get kind of a non-antagonistic role out of Brad Dourif, which is kind of interesting, because he always kind of plays the bad guy. I mean, Charles Lee Ray, and in Lord of the Rings, and all the different things. Uh, what was it like working with, with Brad? I mean, he's, he's excellent as he is, but he also has that kind of crazy streak, as Jeff does in his film roles. Well, the biggest thing with Brad was just casting him. 50% of a movie's casting it. I mean, seriously. I mean, it, it's the the actors you cast. That's the biggest decision you make as a director, and half of your job working with actors is casting properly. You know, if they if you've cast well and you've kind of given them you know the basic points of their character, they usually should be able to more or less take the ball and run with it. And Brad, I had to tell him nothing to. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. <laughs> That's great. Uh, you know, I've been I. Mean, I we blocked it out on the set, and then mm -hmm. he, he just went off and did it. I mean, I thought it was fun in that movie casting uh, Durf as a good guy, because mm -hmm. I find him very likable anyway when he's playing bad guys. Yeah, and I think he should play more good guys. But uh, his character, he, he brought that wild, irreverent kind of humor to it. But I'm uh, wondering <coughs> now. Uh, we were talking about the score and how amazing it was, and there's also some incredibly beautiful camera work in this. Mm. So, do uh, we get to see this on Blu-ray anytime soon, or do you know anything about not, DVD releases? Not at the moment. It's, it just got uh, released on DVD about two years ago, and uh, hopefully we'll get a Blu-ray. Uh, yeah, because that would really bring every element to life even more so. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. <laughs> so let's hope for that. Now, I have one other question about it's sort of on the body parts line. I'm curious to know because you were a writer and director on that. And are you writer director on 100 Feet as well, your latest film? Yes. Okay. So do you feel like um, it's easier to get a film made when you're attached in both ways? Or do, is it easier to just sell scripts or to direct someone else's scripts as far as getting the job? Well, you know, I never had any like big career plan to be a writer director oh. or hyphen it you know I love I, lo I love directing movies the, the, what's happened there the ones that I've written are the ones that have been easiest to direct and been, been easiest to get made and I really don't know why that is um, you know it's you know the uh, but I think that today you know when you have a package it's probably somewhat easier to get a movie made hmm. And, you know, people can see my films and have an idea what they're going to get. Uh, but it's sometimes, it's, it, you take a long time between projects. Is this a calculated move? I'm selective. And, you know, sometimes it, it will take, a, I, will stick with, um, I will stick with a project until it gets made. And sometimes that can take, you know, I, I think 100 feet took three months to get made. Ah. 
you know, other ones have taken 10 years. So tenacity counts. Tenacity is everything. <laughs> Perseverance in, in the film business is the single most important characteristic. You can't quit. You simply have to, because, you know, you never know when a movie's going to find the right time. And I, I kind of believe that a movie gets made, like a script gets made at the right time and the right elements. Like with Bad Moon, I had several times before I finally made it with Morgan Creek where the film almost got made, uh, usually with a lower budget. And, you know, when it finally did get made at Morgan Creek, it had the right budget for it. And, you know, so I think these things kind of happen, I, I like to think, they kind of happen at the right time. Now I want to talk about Bad Moon, uh, another another film I enjoyed of yours. Would I be out of line in saying, and this is how I explain the film to people, it's kind of like Lassie <laughs> meets Howling? Is that kind of, is that is that crazy? Does sure. That crazy? <laughs> yeah, all right, cool, I got it, all right. Now the inspiration behind the story, I mean, what, what kind of made you want to adapt that, something like Bad Moon? Well, I, I got a hold of the book. Again, a little similar to Body Parts. I said my agent at the time sent me the galleys of a bunch of books that were coming out, and there was this log line about a, a dog who lives with a family, and the uncle moves in, and the uh, the, the uh, dog realizes the guy's a werewolf. Yeah. And I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> what a Hitchcock idea! Shadow yeah. of a doubt with a dog, you know. <laughs> and um, I got a hold of Wayne's book, uh, Wayne Smith, who wrote it, and it's just a magical novel. It's the, and the book is told entirely from the dog's point of view. Oh, wow. Literally entirely. A lot and of woofs and barks in there, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, he got, I mean, he, Wayne literally caught, because I'm a dog man, he mm -hmm. caught how dogs must think, feel, experience, their experience of their owners as a pack, and this wonderfully dark, I guess, <laughs> idea that, you know, suddenly one of his pack members is another dog mm. and wasn't before. And, you know, that, I, that just, that's the kind of stuff that, that I just, drives me crazy. I love it. Hmm. You know, and I, th I knew that in the movie we couldn't do it strictly from the dog's point of view, of course. Um, but I thought, gray. yeah, <laughs> everything in black and white. <laughs> Maybe we'll do the remake that way. Yeah, sure. Um, but I, th I thought that since the audience and the dog had the same information, it would work the same way because they both have the the audience and the dog share the same point of view. Mm -hmm. We know what the other people in the family don't. Um, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a movie that's a horror movie, but it's also a family story about unconditional love. Hmm, it's kind of a scarier version of Fluke. Did you ever see Fluke? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you must see it I if you're like a dog I still like my Lassie man. meets Howling. I'm sticking <laughs> okay, with Lassie okay. meets Howling. You can have it. All right, good. Excellent. Um, now, they always say when directing a film, stay away from two things. Don't direct kids and don't direct animals. <laughs> and you did both in this film. Was it difficult? Was it kind of a, was that an interesting mountain to climb working on the, both of those things? No, it's just another production logistic. I mean, the biggest thing with the dog in this was casting the right dog because German Shepherds all look different. I mean, they, oh. they really do. Hmm. And we had to find a dog that had that right primal look. And we actually ultimately selected the animal trainer. It took six months to find this, uh, the, we had an animal trainer in Vancouver who sent us a photo of this dog, Primo, that had never done any films before. And he just had this primal force in his face. And I was like, that's it. Wow, get the yeah, dog, I can get. See that. He's, that's he's, great. Yeah. This sequence here was the most fun sequence to film because it uses everything. I mean, we have, yeah. there we have uh, Primo fighting with the. the uh, Stunt man in the werewolf suit, <laughs> and it looks really savage. But what actually he's playing with the dog? Yeah, it looks. It he's looks, just doing this, yeah, and then just you know, swatting back and forth. That's great. But it looks fierce, and we had uh, animatronic dogs, we had animatronic werewolves, we had puppet dogs, we had. Oh my and goodness! It was great. That whole scene was storyboarded, and it was. Um, great fun to create that kind of reality, that dog werewolf fight. Yeah, how do you get you the know? dog to read the storyboard? He doesn't. Oh, okay. Just put tree tree in. We go. <laughs> okay. Something like that. Okay, so you I'll guys. move on to my next question. <laughs> <laughs> you basically like destroy a house at the end of this, and the family dog, and it's just so intense. Uh, is uh, there's it's almost. We don't destroy the family dog. <laughs> you, you don't. Yeah, no, you, you basically. Oh, including the but the dog is in the final scene with the house. It's battle damage, I guess. <laughs> damage, <Yeah. laughs> right. Well, you know he's hurt. Um, but now, is this one of the more complex scenes that you've directed, as far as all, everything had to fall into line? Was it shot sort of in sequence? It was shot in sequence, and it was shot in two and a half days. The whole fight scene in the bedroom, and it used uh, we we used all different things from a real dog. We actually had a, a uh, we brought in a dog uh, a. Border 
guard dog from um, Russia. For once, there's one sequence, and we actually only wound up using him in one sequence, but uh, one shot. But it's where he runs and piles into the werewolf and knocks him across the room. And well, that werewolf, the actors in it, is about seven feet tall. Oh wow! And the dog is really small, and we had to, you know, we had to cover the cameras and the camera people with um, plexiglass <laughs> because the, the animal was. The dog was pretty serious. Oh my goodness! And the, yeah, the yeah. stunt suit itself, we had, I had a special suit built just for that shot that was about uh, three inches thick. And you know, the dog came in, took him down, and we took the dog out. And <laughs> it was very safe, but it, it all was in sequence, and it was all storyboarded. And you know, you figure out in one scene, well, we're going to need a dummy dog to throw against the light. You know, this scene we can do the 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 main snarling attack we can do with uh, you know our real dog. Oh, and, I see. You know, so when you break it down like that it doesn't seem quite as intimidating? Well that's filmmaking. You know I mean the, the the fun is doing these complex scenes and creating this kind of reality but you know it's all about breaking it down and working out each detail. Hmm. Now speaking of reality you deal with a, a very real thing which is claustrophobia in your most recent film 100 Feet. We actually have a trailer for those who haven't seen or, or, or gotten a chance to see the film yet. Let's take a look at that and we'll come back and chat. Enjoy the fresh air. The last time you'll get to. You're now under house arrest, and you'll remain in these premises for the duration of your entire sentence. <laughs> what happened? You wouldn't believe me. Try me. Mike did this to me. Only Mike's dead. Well, he's taking the news badly. I guess living in a house where you killed your husband must be tough on anyone, huh? This is my house. And I'm not leaving, you hear me? It's been a long time since you've been to confession, Marty. <laughs> Intense, just intense. Now, this this film deals with a lot of things, including claustrophobia. Is that something that is near and dear to you, or are you claustrophobic? No, okay. but it's a it's a um, it's a basic component of tension. Mm -hmm. And for a thriller, you know, claustrophobia is uh, is an important thing to play with. I mean, this whole uh, picture was basically you know a woman under house arrest um, who is being haunted by the ghost of of her husband. And you know she's she can only go a hundred feet in her in her building and in the script the what interested me about that was to make an actual two hour film that really was almost a mano a mano hmm. between this woman and in this predicament and you know this really brutal uh, ghost of her husband who actually kind of has a legitimate grudge hmm. she killed him in self defense but she did kill him yeah and you know and he's mad about it and you know it was it, it it deals a little bit the theme in it was a bit about the psychology of abuse hmm. and the psychology of victimization which is why the why she actually they should you know she was a, a battered wife and she has to go through this ordeal and uh, kind of confront the ghost of her husband in order to finally get free yeah, I don't think we've seen a woman against ghost film like this since The Entity. Remember that one? Yes, great movie. <laughs> it is. An influence on, on a, an absolute influence on 100 feet. Yeah, that's intense stuff. Now, I'm curious to know, you were talking a little bit earlier about sort of the juxtaposition between the claustrophobic space of the car in the hitcher and the wide open spaces of the desert and how fun that was to play with story-wise. Mm -hmm. um, can you liken that to anything in 100 feet because it all takes place inside the house? Is that correct? I mean, is that... Well, 100 feet was more straight claustrophobia because, you know, you, you, have, you, you can't leave this house yeah. and you almost never do through the entire movie. Um, the Hitcher is more elegant claustrophobia because even when you're out on the road, you know that there's nobody around and that somewhere this this killer's out there. So you still it's a whole idea that you can't get away. Uh -huh. <clears throat> you know that's what creates claustrophobia. Um, but in a hundred feet, you know, I shot it the exteriors on a Brooklyn brownstone, and then we built the whole house in uh, Budapest. So we needed to be able to fly the walls and ceilings, and hmm. you know, for I mean, what the the only cha the biggest challenge when you're doing a movie like 100 Feet is to keep it visually interesting. 
you know. So brownstones are wonderfully gothic affairs. And it also, by having setting it in one of these old brownstones, even though it's a contemporary story, gave it a kind of Henry James turn of the screw, old New York. You know, mm. that seems to be where ghost stories, yeah. they're kind of old Edgar Allan Poe kind yeah. of things, you know. Yeah. And another person that really excels at that is Polanski. Yeah. You know, I mean, The Tenant is a great one. Did you look at some of those films for any reference, or are they all right here in your head already, and you're just kind of channeling some of the better things that you've seen? I definitely looked at uh, Repulsion. Uh, I watched Repulsion because, amazing. you know, the, I love in the, you know, in the latter part of the movie when the girl is going more and more mad, you know, the way that the, that apartment that she's in, which I, I guess what, the last half of that movie pretty much never leaves the apartment. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they moved and changed and altered very, I mean, Polanski's a master of leading you around by the nose. That's, that's his genius. He's a master of subliminal storytelling and, and suspense. And, by the slight alterations of that place that ultimately get pretty extreme and, and he, he puts you in the head of this woman who's going mad and you know we had a little bit of a similar thing going with Famke's character Marnie in this you know she's going more she's being more and more terrorized Hmm. Marnie, is that a Hitchcockian reference? Yeah, sure is. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking about Famke, I remodel all the time. You know? <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. Nothing yeah. wrong with it. We love it. Yeah. Now, speaking about Famke, I mean, she she's absolutely excellent in the film, and and she's got that strong kind of survivor feel to it. Was there something specific that that when you screen tested with her, you really wanted to pick up on? I mean, what quality was it that got her the role? Out of curiosity. Well, she had a combination of, um, and we didn't screen test her. We, oh, we, really? we, we interviewed her. Oh, wow. Um, and I, w I was actually, she's very, very, very intelligent as well. And she, she really wanted to play, it's a very flawed character that she plays, not a straight heroine. I mean, she, her character's got a lot of edges, and she really wanted to play that. And I think it was that combination of being absolutely beautiful. I mean, she's, you know, she's just one of the most beautiful women in the world. Mm -hmm. But um, also having that, you know, tough, emotional, kind of visceral force. You had to have, the, the trick with this movie was you're going to basically be in the whole movie with one actress. Yeah. So you couldn't just cast a beautiful actress. You had to have somebody who could, you could actually want to watch for an hour and a half, and that was the big challenge. And I knew with Famco we'd... You know, because a lot of her role doesn't have dialogue. You know, she would do it with looks, glances, expressions, and she does. You know, you 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 know, throughout the movie, you know, you really you're always interested to see what she's doing, and she communicates an incredible amount. You know, just by expressions. Hmm. And she's excellent in the film, as I said. It's it's haunting almost. Oh, I need to see it. Yes, definitely. Now, while 100 Feet was your most recent film uh, uh, project, one of your most recent projects was uh, Containment over with IDW Comics. Yes. Now, what brought you to the graphic novel and comic book world after working in film for so long? Oh, I think it's a natural. Yeah. You know, I think for writers and directors in particular, you know, I mean, comics are essentially storyboards. It's a very, very similar vocabulary to motion picture storyboarding, you know, where, you know, you, which I do which I've always done before every film. I've storyboarded all the key scenes and sometimes the whole film. It's, the pre, it's a pre-visualization process where you just work out every single shot in advance. So comics like films are telling stories with pictures, but with a, you know, with a different vocabulary. Like for example, in a movie where you might use a crane shot, uh -huh. You know, in a comic to get the same effect, you might use a two-page splash panel. There it is. You know, and it was a really fun um, kind of working that, working with that different vocabulary. You actually, a comic script is much more intensive than a film script because you have to write out every single panel and everything that happens in it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and but the other fun part about it is the the instant gratification, which, you know, I mean, a movie takes a year or mm -hmm. so to make. Comic, you turn in the script and the art's done like two weeks later. Huh. So, so in a year or so, what will we be seeing from Eric Red? Any films? I'm working on a Western at the moment oh. with horror elements. Vampires, out of curiosity? <laughs> werewolves. Oh, I love it. Well, when you go to vampires, you got to go to werewolves. I still want to talk about containment, though. I mean, you seem to know the lexicon of the comic book world. Are you a fan of that, of that uh, comic book, of the comic book world? I mean, publications? Some. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's certain graphic novels which um, really made a huge impression on me that made me want to kind of try my hand at it. Mm -hmm. That it, it's an incredibly immersive form of storytelling. And, you know, if done right. 
you know, where you, it's not a film, it's not a book, mm -hmm. you know. Who illustrated uh, Containment, out of curiosity? Nick Stakel. What put you in touch with him? Was it IDW Strictly, or Yes. You, oh, okay. Interesting. Now, Containment, there's, it's zombies in space, for those of you who don't know, we showed a lot of panels. Uh, something like that is very cinematic, as you said, you, you kind of know the world there on how easy it is to take that storyboard. The, the next logical step to make it a movie? I yes. Mean, yeah? Is that, is that a plan? That's definitely a plan. Interesting. Can we do zombies in space getting killed? <laughs> Definitely. Can we? Yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, now, final question. Uh, you are working on, on werewolves in, uh, in the West, which I think is brilliant. Um, you've adapted a lot of things. You've worked on a lot of original things. Is there one kind of story or one kind of novel in specific that you've always wanted to get your hands on that you haven't yet, that you're still kind of your holy grails or one out there that you really want to work on? I don't know if it's a holy grail, but I would love to film a book called The Alienist. Which is a serial killer story set in turn of the century New York. Hmm. I've got a, I, I'm a big history it. fan, mm -hmm. and you know it, it. It has one of the best serial killer characters, but it's also about a group of uh, young people who are uh, led by a psychiatrist to find them. But it's all set in this incredible backdrop of turn of the century Manhattan, and. It would be a great epic horror film. I really don't know why. I hope somebody makes it if I don't make it. But I don't know why it hasn't been made. And that's certainly, that's, that's one I sort of It's incredibly weighty. It will be difficult to translate properly onto film. I wonder if, the, do you know if the rights are, I'm sure that they're well secured. I'm sure they are. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so that much for coming. That means you and me won't be making that movie, The Alienist. Probably we not. Probably. Else. We always ask that question so we can work on whatever you want. <laughs> That's why we ask. No, thank you so much for coming in today, Eric. I really This was a lot it. of fun. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll hang out a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah. He's ready to go. Before no. we go, uh, I definitely want to thank everybody uh, for the show. Thank you again, Creation Entertainment, uh, for Weekend of Horrors. Don't forget to check us out on Twitter, TWI Horror, our, our awesome Facebook page. Everything cool there. You could like me on Facebook. You could like Stacy everywhere. Just like Stacy in general if you can. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, before we go, we have uh, another trailer from Hell for you. Oh, yeah. Yes. It, this is the Trailers from Hell uh, Private Parts with John Landis. It's this pretty is, intense. So until yeah. we'll be watching. leaving you with that. Yeah. Until next week, for Stacey Lane Wilson, I'm Matt Robb. Take care, guys. Bye. Hi. I'm Pigmeat Markham, and this is Trailers from Hell. Today we're going to look at the 1972 film Private Parts, which was produced by Gene Corman for MGM, although they were so ashamed of it, they formed another company to release it. Um, it's now proudly MGM, but on home video from Warner Brothers. Brave New World. Anyway, this is a movie I saw on Hollywood Boulevard in the Grindhouse. I really was taken with it at the time because clearly this was someone of talent. It's still probably Paul Bartel's best film. Let's look. That's a very bad camera move that brings us to Lucille Benson, who's very creepy in this picture. Um, I saw this at the Hollywood Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, which is now the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, which is appropriate, I guess. Um, this was Paul Bartel before I knew him, beautifully photographed by Andy Davis. This is a genuinely odd and campy and creepy, kinky movie. All right, Mrs. Quigley, this is my niece, Cheryl. She's staying with us for a while. This young lady, Anne Ryman, I don't know what happened to her, but she was very, very good in this. This was really creepy. Um, it was really kind of Argento, like, er, like from the 60s. <laughs> but it's a very American movie, downtown L.A. Lucille Benson is quite insane. So are most of the people in it. Aunt Martha, who lives in the room next to mine? Nobody. It's a storage room. Why do you ask? It's just really bizarro. That's Lucille's son. This is, there's a wacky priest. There's lots of murder. It's an extremely gender-confused picture, which, like a lot of Paul's movies, that's what it's about, with a terrible image of a syringe full of blood being injected into a plastic doll filled with water. Always good to have a wacky priest. This is a really good movie. I actually think this is a very good movie and very unknown for the kind of kinky serial killer slasher creepy crazy woman in a motel hotel downtown LA kind of movie so I recommend it highly Paul Bartel was a delightful and genuinely sweet man who I worked for twice once as uh, a stunt guy but I had a line of dialogue in Death Race 2000 and then Sylvester Stallone kills me Allison. you can 
stay here and be my son. Your son? Yes, you could have this room. I have to! Never know. There's a giant knife, which leads us to believe, yep, things are not going to go well for that guy. This is another kind of Mrs. Bates crazy mother, although she's alive and well. There's someone being burned in the incinerator. I, You know what? I don't want to give away too much. This is a good movie with a very European aesthetic. Always good to see rats electrocuted. Private parts.